Hello, uh, my name is Shifan. Today I'm going to talk about Locust and uh, how to shuffle both fast and slow on a serverless architecture. So this is a joint work with Shivan from UW Medicine and my advisor, Jan Stoika. So it, in the recent years, serverless computing has really displaced an incredible rate of growth in both industrial deployment and academia research, right? Cloud providers have been providing serverless computing platforms such as AWS Lambda, Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions, and IBM Cloud Functions, right? In the very core, what serverless computing does is that it enables users to simultaneously launch thousands of short-lived cloud workers with transparent elasticity and fine grained usage billing. For example, with service computing, a user can submit a function to the cloud and then explores massive level parallelism with a large number of workers to finish a task in near real time. This kind of primitive is really similar to the map function when we talk about map reduce, and which makes service computing a great fit for embarrassingly parallel analyst workload. And indeed, in recent years, we have seen many frameworks that have leveraged such kind of primitive for various applications, such as video encoding, scaling Python functions, or doing large block matrix computation. One reason of running these applications on top of a serverless framework is that while we can retain the similar or even better performance compared to a traditional deployment, sometimes we can also save resource in terms of usage because of these advantages, one natural direction is to extend beyond just embarrassingly parallel analytics workloads and to do general analytics on a service computing framework. With general analytics, there are multiple stages involved in a single query, and while each stage might resemble the kind of stage we are talking about earlier for embarrassingly parallel jobs, what's really the key difference here is the shuffle stage between the, those different stages. And indeed, to enable this general service analytics, the key is really to do cost-efficient shuffle, right? Shuffle is the key operation for many uh, operators like joins or group buys in SQL, and more than 70% of the TPCDS queries have shuffles in it, and there are also many studies that suggest that uh, shuffle is really the most expensive operation in analytics workload. So how can we perform cost-efficient shuffle on a serverless architecture. To study this problem, we are going to use a very well-known cloud uh, sort benchmark. So cloud sort benchmark basically ranks, so it's a com uh, competition uh, benchmark which ranks lowest cloud cost to solve 100 terabyte of data. So we're using this benchmark because here we're not only concerned about performance, we're also concerned about how much money we spend because in the end we are using serverless because we want to get good performance and saving costs at the same time. So currently the record of cloud sort is held by Apache Spark. Spark can finish sorting 100 terabyte data under 15 minutes with $144. Later, I'm, now I'm going to show you how Spark basically does the sort so hopefully later we can see if we can pour the same kind of sort onto a service setting. So the way Spark does this sort is pretty straightforward. Here we have 100 type of input data. Spark first launched a stage with a number of partition tasks, where each partition task basically reads one input file and range partition the input records by their key into a different set of partitions. And for each of the range, they are going to write out one intermediate data file into the local storage. And then Spark will launch a second stage with a number of merge tasks. For each merge task, it has to read all the files for a particular range. For example, the first merge task will basically read one each file from each of the partition tasks for the first range. And similarly goes for all the other tasks. And finally, for each merge task, will sort all the record for that particular range and output the result. result. Because all the ranges are already sorted, then the entire uh, input is sorted. So here we see that for traditional analytic systems such as Spark to do this uh, extensive shuffle, what it does, it, it basically directly communicates the shuffle data 
or intermediate data across the servers that execute the tasks. Spark can do so because it runs long-running agents that, ex uh, that run on each of those servers. But even if the tasks from previous stage are queued or finished, we can still have the later uh, tasks from the later stage to read all the input data because the long-running agents are still there running. But what happens when we use the serverless setting, right? In serverless setting, all the tasks are short-lived. And because of that, we also don't have any control of the server. We cannot deploy any long-running agents on top of the server. So when the tasks from previous stage finish, all the data will be recycled. And all the containers, all the storage will be recycled by the platform. So tasks from later stage cannot read the data anymore. So directly communicating between the servers is a no-go on a serverless setting. So how can we deal with this problem? A nat natural solution for this problem is to use something, uh, some cloud storage system, such as S3. This is a very natural solution because a lot of frameworks already use S3 to store input or output results. And we also know for a fact that S3 or other cloud storage systems have very cheap capacity. Storing 100 tab of data on S3 for a couple of hours will probably only take a couple of dollars. And we also know that systems like S3 has very elastic bandwidth. For example, here, we launch a different number of Lambda workers and let the workers to read and write to S3. As we find out, when we increase the number of Lambda workers, the total aggregate bandwidth we can get from S3 to those workers almost scale linearly. So it seems to me that S3 is a very promising candidate. So if we want to shuffle where S3, basically we have S3 sits outside of the compute uh, infrastructure and let the map task to write out all the data into the S3 before they exit. And then later tasks can just directly read the data from S3. So the question here is because we are concerned with cost, is then how much cost uh, are we going to pay to shuffle all the data via S3? So we early know that S3 has very cheap capacity, so the question becomes, uh, and because S3 charges a small premium for each of the requests a user makes, the question becomes how many requests does it take to shuffle all the data into S3? So we go back to the earlier diagram of showing the cross sort, and we can see that total number of intermediate files we're generating is denoted by uh, multiplying the number of partition tasks by the number of merge tasks. And here, because we don't have control of the servers, we cannot consoli consolidate the data transfers across different containers within a server. So we cannot reduce the number of requests, and the number of requests will be the same as number of intermediate data files. And also because we are having a very fine green sharing model on serverless compute infrastructure, all the serverless containers are usually resource constrained, meaning that you can only allocate to a maximum of few gigabytes for a particular serverless worker. So assuming that we're using one gigabyte of serverless workers, the number of partition mer or merge tasks we are going to have can be calculated by dividing the total amount of data by the uh, maximum memory we're getting. Right, so we are having 100,000 tasks for both partition and merge. So the number of total files that we need to shuffle uh, via S3 becomes 10 billion files. And plugging the cost, which lo uh, looks as a seemingly small premium, which is $5 per 1 million requests, we have to spend $50,000 just to shuffle in between the S3. In addition, not only that we have to spend a lot of money to do shuffling on S3, we also cannot get a very good performance. As we do the experiment, we find out that S3 actually has a limit in terms of operations per second you can get. Right here, we launch a different number of Lambda workers, and we find that for the particular object size, S3 will bottleneck at 44,000 operations per second, 4,400 operations per second. And taking the total number of requests we need to make divided by the IOPS provided by S3, we find that even for writing all the outputs into S3, it takes 26 days. So in summary, basically for cloud storage system like S3, it lacks really cheap and elastic IOPS support for doing, 
for ser serving as a medium for shuffling data between analytics stages. So, of course, there are many storage systems out there provided by many different uh, cloud providers. Can we find the cloud storage system that can support the shuffle for analytics workloads? A natural alternative will be something like Elastic Cache because we know for a fact that uh, cache systems that use memory can provide very high IOPS. So we try that. So we plug out S3 and put in Redis. And we find out that because we're shuffling a large amount of data, we need more than one Redis instance to store all the data. To store all the 100 terabytes, even for the largest Redis instance, RFI 24x large, we can find on AWS, we need 158 uh, instances. And just for the capacity, it takes 1.6 thousand per hour. And even if we can beat the cloud sort benchmark by the shuffle time, we will have to cost 10 times more, even for just storing all the data. So we also, uh, basically here, the takeaway here is Redis capacity is too expensive to do the kind of shuffle we want for serverless analytics. So there are also other, many other cloud systems out there. We surve surveyed all, uh, all of them. So what we find is that we can basically categorize all the cloud storage services out there into two broad categories. The one is that uh, cloud storage systems that can offer very cheap capacity, a high amount of capacity with a moderate cost, but really uh, suffers from very bad IOPS. And there are also fast storage systems Actually, that um, provide very uh, um, good performance in terms of operations per second, but are really expensive in terms of the capacity we're paying. So can we leverage the strengths of the different storage types to do the shuffle? So in Locus, we basically hybrid the different types of storage systems to achieve cost-efficient shuffle operations. The intuition here is basically to use faster storage to absorb the IOPS and create, create bigger chunks for slow storage. To, to go back to the 100 terabyte sort example, we are not going to allocate 100 terabyte of cache for the sort, but instead we're going to divide the shuffle into multiple rounds. For example, we can divide the shuffle into 20 rounds, and for each round we are only going to uh, sort five terabyte of data. Because of that, we only need to allocate five terabyte of cache. So what Locus does is basically for each round, it performs the similar kind of shuffle we're talking about when we use Redis, and write all the output data into S3. And for here, we reduce the total number of requests from 10 billion to basically the number of mergers, which is 100,000 requests that we need to write to S3. And we repeat this by clean the cache after each round and repeat it for the total number of 20 rounds. And finally, we can use the merge step to merge all the results that have already been stored in S3 to generate the final data. By doing this, we reduce the total number of S3 requests from 10 billion requests to uh, 2,000, uh, actually, 200,000 requests. And the total memory cache needed from 100 terabyte to 5 terabytes. I'd like to point out that this is not I mean, uh, free launch, and we're making a trade off of basically doing the shuffle with two paths. But because we are almost getting free bandwidth on S3, and we can scale linear, uh, have high elasticity on in terms of uh, Lambda workers, this trade off is worthwhile. And finally, we show that. By implementing this kind of hybrid sort, uh, we can get a very close performance of uh, 15 minutes with $163. This is uh, with the fact that Lambda unit price is five times more expensive compared to running VMs, which means that Locus can achieve a similar performance compared to running Spark with five times less perform uh, resource in terms of com uh, compute resources. So we, I talk about how to use this hybrid uh, shuffle to do cost-efficient shuffles, but there are also many other things to decide when we shuffle uh, 
doing shuffle on, for analytics job. In particular, we need to decide whether to use this kind of shuff hybrid shuffle or not. And on last side, there are many other configurations, including the amount of fast cash we need to allocate, as well as the worker size. And it turns out that navigating the cost performance with different compute and storage configurations is rather difficult. For example, we have to decide how many service workers we use and or what are the worker size. To just illustrate, uh, illustrate this, here I have an example of uh, shuffling 20 gigabytes of data. And we shuffle this with different amount of worker memory. And we see that when we increase the worker memory size, uh, the performance, uh, when we reduce the worker memory size, and while we're getting more uh, service workers, we can increase the parallelism to get more aggregate bandwidth to improve the performance. But while we are uh, uh, using the same uh, configuration for a much larger uh, shuffle size, because now we have having too many workers, which uh, saturate the IOPS on S3, we're actually getting worse performance when we have a smaller workers or more workers. And here, the optimal point is to choose the largest worker size. And sometimes, the optimal point is somewhere in the middle. So our performance model covers both the performance and cost for various different kinds of SOL implementations. I'm not going to go to the details because it might take uh, 30 minutes for me to just go over all of the model. And here I just want to give a very fast example to give you a flavor of how we model the sort or the shuffle on the server setting. So for example, I'm giving an example on how we model for the case of doing uh, shuffle only with the slow storage, something like S3 or other cloud object systems. We are using analysis, analysis basically based on the different bottlenecks we are going to come across in doing this uh, shuffle. For example, we can basically model the bottleneck where we're trying to shuffle all the data out of the Lambda workers, right? Because we can have the total amount of shuffle size, and when we have a fixed configuration with uh, decided worker size and the level of parallelism, we can calculate the total aggregate bandwidth we are getting on, on the Lambda workers. And similarly, we can calculate the bat, uh, bottleneck in terms of uh, um, for the for the storage systems. We can calculate the bottleneck both for the IOPS and also the aggregate bandwidth on the storage systems. Here, for the slow storage only example, we can calculate uh, the amount of time it takes to shuffle all the data into S3 by basically dividing the total number of requests we need to make by uh, the amount of IOPS that was going to support it by S3. And finally, the total uh, transfer time for that particular phase can keep be calculated as the maximum for all of the bottlenecks. And we do this kind of modeling for all different shuffle implementations and, and predict the time and cost for each configuration. And given a user policy, we pick the best uh, shuffle implementation for that policy. So we implement Locus on top of Pyra, which is a Python uh, analytics framework on top of uh, service uh, platforms. And we use AWS as Lambda uh, as the service computing platform and use S3 as the slow storage, Redis as fast storage. So our system is pluggable to be used with other uh, cloud storage systems or computing platforms. In fact, uh, IBM has also uh, its own implementation of Pyra. So we invalidate the locus on a number of workloads, including a uh, core sort, uh, TPCDS benchmark, and big data benchmark. And we ca compare locus with the vanilla Pyron without uh, doing the shuffle, and uh, without the hybrid shuffle or the performance model, and as well as apply Spark on a number of virtual machines, and also existing call service, uh, such as Redshift. I'm not going to show you all the evaluation results. You can check them out in the paper. But uh, just to look at the performance for TPCDS, we find that uh, with Locus, because we are running on a service infrastructure, and we can always clean back the compute resource when we no longer need them. And for a lot of the TPCDS uh, queries, they have varying uh, level of parallelism across different stages. So doing Locus can significantly reduce the total amount of resource 
that is required to complete a, sh uh, a query. For, um, for here, we, we are able to reduce the uh, resource needed for query 16 and query 94 by up to uh, 59%. And at the same time, we're not sacrificing on the performance, regardless of the fact that uh, Lambda workers use uh, uh, are five times more expensive and often use uh, less uh, efficient hardware, we are actually beating uh, Spark for most of the queries. And um, this is not the first work to study the problem of doing shuffling uh, on a service architecture. Um, in particular, there's a work in OSDI 18 that uh, looks at designing a new Alexis store that scales to applications demand when uh, shuffling data. So our work basically focuses on a currently deployable solution that uses existing uh, cloud storage systems. And in a world that these new uh, data stores uh, are usable or provided by cloud providers, our performance model is still useful for deciding the combination of different storage types. So in conclusion, in Locus, by judiciously combining different storage types, we can achieve cost-efficient shuffle for service analytics. And Locus achieved this by design algorithms that hybrid different storage uh, types. And we introduced a performance model that captured the characteristics of different shuffles and st uh, storage mediums. And in evaluation, we showed that uh, Locus can save up to 59% of usage while, achieve, uh, while achieving several performance compared to traditional models of running assistance on top of a uh, number of virtual machines. And this concludes my talk. Thanks. Hey, Rodrigo. Rodrigo Fonseca from Brown. Uh, very nice work. Uh, one question about the general generality of this. Are there any transfer, uh, any shuffle operations that you can't transform because you either hit some limit, or for example, maybe the merge function becomes too large that you can't run it on the limits that Lambda or whatever provider gives you? Yeah, so uh, we can actually do the, sh so we can, in our case, we always break the task small enough to fit into the current limit of Lambdas, and current the limit is basically 10 minutes, which we find to shoot most of the uh, workloads. And we think this limit is also going to improve in the future. Uh, Himanshu, Microsoft. Um, it, uh, the question is about, um, can you use this kind of hybrid approach with the VM model that you showed? Like, if you flip it, if you just use the same approach with VMs, mm -hmm. could you get any benefit out of it? Like, I like the, the hybrid model that you're using. Yeah. I, I don't know anything about serverless. Yeah. Can I just use it with the Apache Spark? So I think, I mean, the kind of hybrid uh, shuffling we're introducing basically makes a trade-off of uh, treating very cheap bandwidth, right? So we run this on a virtual machine, then which means that we're basically shuffling the data uh, twice, which I think is probably going to hurt the performance for the traditional uh, approach. While in the service setting, because the bandwidth is cheap and also elastic, we can have a good performance uh, cost point there, if that makes sense. So I had one last question, maybe comment. So it, it seems like there is an interesting opportunity here to potentially pick query plans for some of the TPCDS-like queries in a manner that is not just performance aware, but also cost aware. In, mm -hmm. like you may pick a plan that looks bad otherwise, but is optimal for, from the perspective of your shuffle cost. Yeah. Have you given any thought to how you may change a query optimizer in a way that, that is aware of this? So you mean look, look at the basically the entire plan in addition to just the shuffle? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the model currently just focuses on the shuffle part, but you can definitely extend it to look, I mean, to include compute and various other phases and to make a more optimal, I mean, plan and generally, yeah. Uh, quick, Hi, quick last question, John Wilkes, Google. Um, I, I like the way you're modeling the, the prices here. I would actually encourage you to call them prices rather than costs because it's not at all clear how closely they're correlated to the underlying system costs. Mm -hmm. If you were to do the work that you wanted to do, yeah. and you actually owned the machines on which they ran, 
would you really use serverless computation to do this? Well, so I mean, I, I sort of, this is actually a semi-rhetorical question. What yeah. I wanted to do is to encourage you to think about, are we, are we using the resources that we got well, or are we actually just abusing somebody's temporary price model? Do, do I need to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank Shifan once again. <clears throat>